Thank you very much. Uh, let's see if I can get a mouse over under the right screen here. Um, so this is sort of the, the portion where it may be in now for something completely different. Uh, in, in trying to keep with the sort of the theme of the conference, I tried to relate to uh, sort of axes of scale. I think that I can do pretty well in terms of hitting two of those, uh, distance and time, uh, time scales that operate on, on things that you just don't see in most terrestrial. We're throwing your, we're throwing the microphone on the floor. Um, in terms of number, not so much. Uh, we've seen deployments of, of DTNs that range into the tens or maybe hundreds of nodes, uh, and there's, there's getting to be some commercial interest in these things, um, but we haven't seen certainly, you know, nothing on the scales of thousands or tens of thousands. Um, I, I, I took some of these slides from a, a, an internal presentation that we'd put together uh, that was actually funded by some of the work in DARPA, and I'll get into sort of what the funding history of all this was. It's rather convoluted, uh, bouncing back and forth between DARPA and NASA, but that's why I have the, uh, the disclaimer down there at the bottom. I ran them through, um, through DARPA's public release so that they wouldn't get upset. Um, and for, for people who are interested, the, the full set of briefings that we put together uh, for this was actually, the, the internal review was actually a lot more technical going into uh, sort of, you know, how, how some of the reliability mechanisms work, uh, how security works, and, and those are, in fact, all publicly released, and I can, uh, I can make those available. Um, so this is just the, sort of the outline of the talk. I'm gonna start with the history and motivation. This is, you, you'll, you'll see that this is a little bit schizophrenic, and as I, as I mentioned, the, uh, that's due to, uh, in large part to the funding history and, and sort of the way this developed. We, we started out in, uh, actually in 97, slightly before I joined MITRE. Um, MITRE got together with uh, NASA and with Vint Cerf uh, through sort of a fortuitous uh, grouping of, of uh, social networks uh, and talked about what it was gonna take in order to really expand the way NASA communicates with things on the surface of Mars. And this was back right around the time, uh, if you remember the Mars Pathfinder mission, one of the first, uh, the little rover that was running around on Mars uh, and doing astoundingly well. Uh, so this started out, uh, then uh, NASA and MITRE went together to uh, DARPA at the time to the Next Generation Internet Initiative and, and said, hey, you know, you guys are looking at sort of, you know, clean slate, uh, what would the internet be like or what would networking be like if you uh, were willing to sort of, you know, start over or look at, you know, completely new approaches and, uh, you know, we've got one. Uh, and, and actually picked up some funding from that, uh, which lasted for a while. Um, and then the, when, when the Next Generation Internet uh, project ran out, uh, the funding transitioned over to NASA, and NASA was actually willing to pick this up uh, as the way to move forward uh, and support it. Uh, and we've since then, uh, it was during that time at NASA, I think that we actually formed uh, the first IRTF working group. We, we had two, one of the first one was actually called Interplanetary Internet. Uh, and we figured that this was good because it caused people like yourselves who actually know how the internet works and all of the vagaries of making things happen uh, to think that we were weird enough not to pick on us, right? We were just, you know, this strange looking person over here talking about stuff. Um, and uh, as we moved on, uh, we got some interest from uh, Intel Research at Berkeley uh, and actually then rechartered the IRTF working group into the Delay Tolerant Networking Research Group. Uh, which has been relatively successful within the IRTF. Uh, we've got, uh, I think, probably five RFCs through uh, with several others that we're gonna be pushing through in, in Hiroshima and, and, and after. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about, you know, the history motivation, uh, a little bit of technical stuff in DTN approach, uh, just enough to sort of, uh, you know, form the foundation for uh, what I wanna talk about in terms of capabilities and protocol mechanisms. Uh, and then the future directions is, you know, the, the scaling in terms of number. You know, what, what, would, it, what would it be like uh, if we could actually uh, scale this up? And, and there are a number of challenges there. Uh, a lot of things would need to change in the way you think about how routing works. Uh, how do you think about what connectivity really means? Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so the, the, this started with uh, talking to not, 
uh, we, we started thinking about Pathfinder, but this really you know, has taken off with the Mars Exploration Rover Spirit and Opportunity that are on Mars. Uh, and there's a real lesson to be learned there. They started out as, as all NASA missions do, and in fact, all of the civilian space agencies, massively conservative. I mean, you know, just could, uh, absolutely, you know, mission managers are given individual pots of money to go do missions. There's very little sort of long-term multi-mission view. Uh, the only people that have that are the people on the ground that are running the ground networks. Uh, things like NASA's Deep Space Network, they see mission after mission. Uh, but, but typically, the way missions are funded uh, is to give a big pot of money to one mission manager, have them go out, build this mission, and run it. And also, because of the time scales that are involved in doing things, uh, not necessarily with Earth observing, but certainly with missions to Mars, you get one of those. Uh, and that sort of explains some of their conservatism. Um, you, you're gonna get one shot at this, it's gonna make or break your career. So the, when Spirit and Opportunity were launched at Mars, uh, like all good missions, they had direct to Earth and direct from Earth comms. The little high gain antenna, it sits down there and swivels and goes and looks at Earth. Um, and, uh, and their plan was to use the, the NASA Deep Space Network, a, a collection of three 70 meter antennas and a bunch of 33 meter uh, beam waveguide antennas to talk to these things at Mars. Uh, and there was this little, you know, so, somebody managed to get an experiment onto the rovers and said, well, you know, you wanna talk to, you, you wanna talk to these things, uh, it's hard to do, you know, you've gotta use S-band, you know, start thinking I've got the next slide is gonna be sort of calibration in terms of, of what the scales are. It's a long way to Mars, it just is. Um, so somebody convinced them to put a little experiment onto the rovers and onto one of the orbiters and said, well, what if you put this little UHF antenna, uh, UHF radio there? And you could communicate then, you could talk from the surface of Mars up to one of these rover, or up to one of these orbiters, and then you could turn around and, and collect that data on the orbiter and turn it around and send it back to Earth. And wouldn't that be cool? Um, and that would let you do all these things. And they had this whole list of, you know, why this was gonna be better. Um, most of which didn't get, uh, didn't actually get implemented until more recently. Um, but okay, fine, it was an experiment, they were willing to try it. And at the time, the, the mission operators, uh, the first couple of times they ran through this said, oh my gosh, I mean, it's a DSL upgrade, back when DSL upgrade was actually a big deal. Um, they said, you know, this is great. All this, you know, a lot more data uh, coming back and also, you know, power implications. Running the high, uh, running the direct to Earth and direct from Earth comms on the rovers costs a lot of power, and mission operators were having to make this decision: Do we drive today? Do we talk today? And it really came down to that. I mean, they just didn't have enough power to do both. Um, and it turns out that it's a lot easier to generate power on orbit than it is down on the surface of Mars, where you've got dust and atmosphere and all sorts of other things. Um, and, and so this is sort of the, you know, the beginning of internetworking, right? You've got uh, this little local link that's going from the orbiter down to the surface, and you've got this long haul link that's going from the orbiter back to Earth, and they actually are using different link layer protocols. Um, so you know, you're starting to get into internetworking. They didn't run it that way, and they still don't. Um, the, the, the actual framing and the mechanism for getting stuff back is incredibly convoluted because they didn't, again, they were very conservative. They didn't want to change anything, so they weren't really willing to go with uh, anything that looked like a network layer or end-to-end -end addressing, uh, they were willing to go with, uh, I know how to do direct to Earth comms from the rovers, I'll just pretend that the, or uh, that the orbiter uh, is the Earth and I'll send whatever I was gonna send to, to Earth directly, I'll send it, but just framed a little bit differently for this local link. Um, so the scaling and distance, one-way light times, um, just to sort of calibrate things, Every, pretty much everybody knows the Earth's about eight light minutes from the sun. Um, it turns out that there are also two, uh, two stable Lagrange points that are pretty important, uh, trailing and, and leading the Earth uh, that are also about eight minutes away. Those are important because if you want to get around the sun, uh, you can send something to one of these Lagrange points and have it orbit there, uh, and it's uh, the, the stable Lagrange points, things will tend to want to stay there in space. Um, Geostationary satellites, about an eighth of a light second away, one way. Uh, so you pay about a half a second round trip time. Uh, 
for, for anybody who's operated an ISP uh, that's, that's getting its data across a geosatellite, you know that that starts to be an issue. All of the, uh, and, and, and that spurred a lot of the performance enhancing proxy work that was done uh, like by Hughes and DirectPC and all, all of the, the things to, to try to mitigate some of those problems with, uh, with TCP. Um, the moon is either really important right now or maybe not as important depending on where you think the Augustine report and constellation is going. Uh, but it remains about 1.28 light seconds away. Um, regardless of, uh, of what you think the funding is to get there. Um, transcontinental fiber I, I, I skipped, you know, something, you know, in, in, the, t in the low tens of milliseconds. Uh, Mars, when it's close, is four minutes away. So you've got an eight minute round trip time. Uh, when it's on the other side of the sun, if you could talk to it directly, it would be 20 minutes away. So anything that you're going to do uh, in, in those time periods, you're going to do, uh, you're going to need to do sort of all of it ahead of time. You know, you've got to be well planned. You've got to know what you're going to do. And you're not going to spend a lot of round trip. There's not going to be a lot of chit chat back and forth uh, in, in order to set things up and, and do communications that way. Um, and I've got a, in a couple slides, I, I talk about why that breaks a lot of, you know, sort of what we do in the internet. Um, so, the, the, the first of these is you've got these huge delays and, and that causes this disruption. Um, sort of another, another little bit of history, this started out as purely delay tolerant networking because we thought, well, you know, the problem has got to be that Mars is four light minutes away, that's really long, um, and, and you're going to have problems communicating there. And we really didn't think about the other, the, the larger problem when we started, which was yeah, Mars is four light minutes away, but there's only three antennas that can ever talk to it, only one that can talk to it at any given time. And by the way, you don't have time on that antenna. Um, so this is, is talking about sort of just the, the purely delay aspect that says, you know, there's stock TCP would, you would just die, um, application layer timers would die. And, and this sort of was the start of motivating this different way uh, of, of going about networking. The other cause of disruption is this intermittent connectivity, so scaling in time. Um, the, the rovers, the exploration rovers right now return about 98% of their data through the orbiter. They get a little bit back from direct to Earth, uh, but most of it is coming through the orbiter. And the, the orbiter lander connectivity, and these are obviously completely made up, uh, but it tends to be a couple of passes in the, in the morning uh, in the beginning of the day on Mars and a couple passes in the afternoon. And depending on exactly where the orbits fall, those things run, you know, in the low tens of minutes, you know, something, uh, something around six to 15 minutes. So you've got a couple of opportunities there. Uh, and and the, the people who run missions are really interested in, in taking advantage of that because it gives them a chance to command in the morning, have something happen, get data back at night, uh, chew on that data overnight, and then command in the morning and, and, and go through that. Um, and then the Earth to orbiter connectivity looks sort of like this thing on the bottom where you've got, uh, you know, a couple of passes per day. They may be two or four hours. They tend to be uh, a little bit longer. The orbiter's doing its own science, collecting a bunch of other stuff uh, above and beyond just what the rovers have. But in between, you've got these huge gaps. So if you think of trying to close a control loop between the mission control center on Earth and something that's down on the surface, you're trying to actually drive the rover. Uh, you know, you've got this round trip time that's looking not just like the four minutes of, of light time to get to Mars, but it's more like, you know, half a day. Because by the time you get your command out and it gets checked and they go through the, uh, you know, transmit up to Mars and to the orbiter, the orbiter has to hold on to that maybe until it goes, you know, halfway around Mars since the two rovers are on opposite sides of the planet. Um, you know, you've got all of this time. You have no end-to-end -end connectivity ever. There's no time when you can take a packet or any kind of, uh, you know, unit of information and launch it towards Mars and actually have it, you know, wend its way all the way down to the rover on the surface uh, using the relay system. Um, and so you get these round trip times that are huge. So this is the disruption causing you delay. Uh, now you've got this, this case where, if I can point with that, you know, if you're willing to queue data in a ground station, uh, then you can queue it there, but until you get your tracking pass, you're not going to transmit anything. You've got to sit and wait 
So the disruption to your link has caused you some delay. Uh, and we started out thinking that uh, the delay was the big issue. When we, when we went through uh, the first round of going to the next generation internet, they uh, were willing to buy off on that, said, yeah, that looks good. Um, when we went back to DARPA again uh, after NASA, uh, we were a little bit further along, and, and, if you, and they were taking us a little bit more seriously by that point. And if you go to DARPA and you say, we have this really wonderful uh, technology, and uh, we can get data through even when there's delay. And they look at you and they say, we don't have delay. Well, yeah, you do. You know, you've got you know, all these radios, the tactical radios that are line of sight. They drop out. No, no, no. You know, delay is bad. We don't like it. Um, but if you go to it and you turn around and you say, well, you know, what are we going to do about that? So we can get your data through even if you have disruptions. They say, oh, yeah, we have that. Because um, they know that you know, there's all sorts of jamming. There are line of sight issues. Um, and so that's, that's sort of how this developed in terms of uh, either delay or disruption tolerant networking. Um, the DARPA PM thought it was a really cool idea to reuse the acronym. That turned out to be stunningly bad. Um, so, so why do you want to do this? Uh, you know, what are the things that would motivate you uh, to look into delay and disruption tolerance? Um, the, the internet protocols, although they were originally designed for packet radio, have grown up to the point that they're just not going to work uh, you know, in, in some of these environments. And there are these sort of inherent assumptions that you have this end-to-end -end connectivity. You know, TCP, ICMP assume that you, know, you can send things and get them all the way through to the other side. Uh, TCP's reliability mechanism is assuming that round trip times are cheap. Right? I, can, I can actually send something and have you acknowledge it and, and have me retransmit it if it gets lost. And that's a good way to do reliability. Um, so you know, the, the, the space environment doesn't meet that. Um, tactical environments tend to not meet that, uh, a lot of those requirements, depending on where you are. Uh, some mobile networks don't. And, and an interesting thing you know, that, that I've been sort of struggling with lately is, you know, where is that breakpoint, right? If you've got an infrastructure, if you've got an infrastructure where you can pull out you know, a BlackBerry and, and you've got one hop connectivity to the network, that's pretty good. Uh, the times when this tends to, to be a win are the times when you can say, well, I don't necessarily have that infrastructure. I've got something that is either uh, completely broken because the hurricane came in, came in and knocked everything out, uh, or I've got one of these space environments, or, or somewhere where uh, you, you just aren't going to get that uh, infrastructure support. So the, the first round conclusions uh, when we went through this were we wanted to be able to reuse uh, internet technologies in places where it made sense. And the, you know, the glorious vision is at some point NASA or ESA or one of the space agencies will actually launch a fleet of rovers and they will go to Mars and collect all sorts of interesting rocks and pick them up and, and play with them and turn them over. Um, and they'll probably want to talk to each other. Uh, and for that, if you could get 802.11 or 802.16 on the surface of Mars, great. Uh, you know, there's no reason not to take the things that we know and understand and simply reuse them, you know, pick them up off the Earth drop them down somewhere else and, and, and reuse that. Um, and then the thought is to bridge that with this notion uh, of the interplanetary network, uh, the, this DTN uh, backbone. I'll talk a little bit about you know, sort of exactly what that bridging means. It does not mean simply taking IP packets and tunneling them across DTN. Um, and, and that really gets into using gateways uh, to, to interface between those environments. And it's sort of like impedance matching. Right, you think about, you've got these very heterogeneous cases. You've got fiber on the Earth. You've got this long-haul space link. You've got maybe the, the short-haul space link on the other end. Environments with, with drastically different characteristics. And if you can actually come up out of the transport layer, if you will, uh, and, and into one of these gateways and, and do the impedance matching, you can tune each one of those segments, whereas you can't make anything work all the way across end to end. And, and, and by doing that, you construct this sort of network of internets idea. Um, people remember the game Frogger, right? You were this little frog, and you had to get across the, all, all the little logs. Th this was sort of the motivational picture for, for why you, you might want to do this. Uh, the top is looking at sort of the end-to-end -end picture. 
and, and I drew this very carefully to make, to make DTN look good. Um, but we've, we've found things that, are, that, that operate like this. Um, and the, the way to read this is uh, source to destination going across four different links and, and a timeline going off to the right and just saying that the, in the heavy green areas, those links are available and in the, the non-green areas, the links aren't. And it's looking at what happens if you try to send a couple of packets down that, you know, down that path. And this is the, the, the top part is assuming that you've got static routing and everything is set up so that you even could launch that packet and that you don't have to do a DNS resolve because, well, that's not gonna happen over four minute delay either. Um, so you may be able to get you know, one or two hops down the path, uh, but then your packet dies because there's just no, there is no next hop. Uh, no next hop, pitch the packet on the floor. If you know, somebody really wanted it there, they would have used TCP, somebody's gonna retransmit it. Um, and, and the bottom is looking at this store and forward notion where you actually make use of each link as it becomes available. Uh, so there what we're doing is, is just moving the data hop by hop uh, through the network and then in the, in the meantime, right, if you, you send that first bit of data and it can't make it across this next link, well, this, this node here then has to hold on to it and wait for the next hop to become available uh, and then get things down. And, and that gives you a couple of sort of interesting results. The first one is the latency is lower. So, we were looking at this uh, at a way to, to deal with times when we had high delays and, and deal with intermittent connectivity and have you know, delay tolerant networking and our delay went down. Um, and the second is, and the, the one that we actually had thought about was that you get uh, a lot more throughput. Um, so the, the mechanism for doing this uh, is, is called the bundle protocol. Uh, and I, I can, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about why the wide bundle on the next slide. Um, but the point is that you can take these things and, and if you sit up here above transport layer, your application can use this and you use some transport layer to get across a chunk of the network and you come all the way up to application layer in, in the internet model here and dump down into another transport layer here to go the next hop. Um, the, the rationale for that really is if you're, if you're operating in this very highly heterogeneous environment, uh, and we did some work uh, like this looking at uh, Navy networks where they have uh, airborne layer and they have things that are, that are shipped to ship comms and then going all the way out to Marines and Eplor's radios. Even if you cheat, even if you say, I know what this path looks like, I know what the bottleneck link is, I'm gonna run you know, a pure rate control transport layer all the way end to end, you still can't do as well as you can do if you do this hop by hop. Because if you've got any appreciable error rate in that path, if you try to go end to end, your error rate compounds as you move down the, down the, uh, down the line. And what DTN does, because we can hold on to this, uh, onto the data each one of these hops, you know, the data may go down here, this, may, this, this node, these things are supposed to represent uh, disks and storage. Um, this node may not be able to hold on to something, it may simply forward it to here, but this guy may be able to take that uh, and commit it to persistent storage and say, you know, I can now be responsible for moving this uh, forward in the network. And the, the goal there is really to, to maintain the gains that you've got, right? You don't wanna be doing retransmissions from the source if the source is a rover on the surface of Mars. If you get something from the surface of Mars up to the orbiter, down to the Earth, through the ground station, you know, out of the ground station back toward the control center, and then you know, there's congestion on the control center land for some reason and you drop something, you, you really can't go back to, well, you know, I really like the, the, the rover to retransmit that, please. Um, it just doesn't work that way. So instead what, the, what DTN has looked at is using this custody transfer model where you give custody to the network. You turn that over and say, look, um, I know that I'm not gonna have an end-to-end -end path. I'm gonna rely on the network to get the, the, the data to the destination. Uh, and then nodes in the middle of the network take custody and there's this custody transfer mechanism that involves uh, you know, sending acknowledgements back within the network. So you know, this is you know, a great departure from sort of the the, the standard model of a, of a dumb network and smart endpoints. Here, because you have uh, you know, all, all of this sort of extra richness in the network, 
uh, the network has to take some, some extra responsibility. Um, and, and that sort of led to this set of design rules. Don't, don't plow the same ground twice. Right? That's what custody transfer is trying to get at. If you've made it across a really rough patch of network, don't go back and try to retransmit from the other end. Um, don't do unnecessary chit chat. This is sort of where the, the, the bundling name came from. Um, if you look at FTP, depending on how you count round trips, FTP can take, takes either eight or 22 round trips before it moves its first byte of data. If you wanna set up the control connection and get logged in, uh, you know, FTP is really chatty in that way. So moving that back and forth across you know, one of these highly, uh, highly challenged networks is gonna be a problem. Instead, what you'd like would be for the application to say, okay, um, you know, tell me all this stuff about this file you wanna move. What's your name? What are your authentication credentials? What's the file? Where do you want it to go? What do you wanna happen if that doesn't work and, and, and something breaks? Take all of that stuff and bundle it into one thing and ship that thing across the network one time and then deal with it at the far side. Um, some other things, uh, you know, don't depend on information that's far away. You're not gonna be able to do a DNS resolve. Uh, so we came up with, uh, at the, in the first cut, a hierarchical routing mechanism uh, that was essentially a two-stage routing where you said the first thing was, uh, what planet are you going to? Where, where are you headed roughly? You know, go that way. I don't know where any of this is, but go over there, ask him. Uh, and then do the resolve down to uh, you know, a specific network layer address. That also lets us decouple things. I mean, you know, Mars is sort of an extreme example uh, in that there are, there are launch opportunities to Mars about every two years. Uh, but we might actually get to the moon and, and might actually get a significant presence on the moon. And that would be, you know, then you'd have a lot of machines. Because if you've got robots, well, okay, you've got, you know, you know, an IP address per instrument you could, you could envision. If you've got people, you've got a lot. Um, and, and so this, this don't force hom homogeneity says, you know, we wanted to be able to take internet technologies, move them somewhere else, reuse them, uh, but you can't force everybody to update at the same time, right? If somebody comes out with IPv7 that actually does accounting the right way and you can charge for multicast and quality of service, Earth, is, Earth will go that way. Uh, you know, the moon, Mars, probably doesn't make sense to do that. So, so how do you do this? Um, as I said, we started out with this hierarchical naming model uh, where the, the endpoints are actually addressed by name, not by address. So they're, they're uh, these URI formatted names uh, that, that we originally used uh, to build up these two-part region identifiers where you would say, you know, what region are you in? And then you didn't have to know anything else about, you know, the, the semantics of names in that region. So that would let you say on, uh, on Mars, you want to go to Earth, and here's an IPv6 address. And the things on Mars didn't have to know squat about what IPv6 addresses really looked like or what their semantics were. They just needed to know how to get to Earth. And it was the job of the gateway on Earth to pick that up and say, okay, uh, you know, I know about Earth addresses, and I know that this really ought to be IPv6, and here's how it, here, here's how it ought to go. So, so what are some of the, you know, the, the simple things you can do with that, right? Um, you can say, you know, uh, format it as a URI, and we've got a provisional DTN uh, URI, eh, my machine slash ping, right? Host name and port. Um, which is typically the way a lot of people who are setting up little test examples uh, uh, tend to name things. And, and ping is actually special in the, the DTN in one of the implementations. Uh, you could envision something that was more hierarchical, something that looked like, you know, Mars Orbiter 8, Instrument 2, and some thermistor, and get at that. Um, sort of just more, more levels of hierarchy uh, in order to get down to, to something that, that essentially comes down to, um, you know, a host and a port. But, you know, these things are just names. So you could put a query in there. You could say, I want to talk to things that are, you know, this sensor net out in the Mojave, and I want this, uh, this bundle, this piece of data, to go to anybody whose temperature value is greater than 20 centigrade. Um, 
Now, how that actually happens and what the routing has to look like behind it in order to make that happen is a different question. Uh, but at least you can sort of start to express things uh, that look like that. So you could say, you know, I want to talk to all the cars on 495 that are going slower than 20 miles an hour, which might be all of them. Um, and then you can start to get into, into sort of more complex things. You could say, uh, I want to talk to anybody who's within 1,000 meters of, you know, I want to talk to the police that are within 1,000 meters of me uh, that have dogs, whatever reason. Uh, I want to I wanna do flood routing, and I want to talk to anybody whose battery level is less than a quarter. Uh, you know, I want to do, uh, and then even, even some more esoteric things, you might want to say, I want to route through this DTN network until I get to some spot that knows about mail. Right, how am I going to actually deliver this thing its last hop? I want to go hop by hop using this custody transfer mechanism, and then when I get to somewhere that knows about mail, I want this thing to pop out and send email to somebody maybe as, as S-MIME or something. Um, and, and this is one of the things that's, that's newer within the, the IRTF working group, looking at, at what does this really mean and, and how do we start to get our, our hands more around this than just, oh, it's this big string and you can do anything you want. Um, routing ends up looking really different here. Right, IP routing wants to look at what does the network look like right now, build that picture and route on it. And that's, that's part of why mobility is such an issue, right? If things are moving, that picture is changing, you've gotta track what that picture looks like uh, and, and, then, and then use that to forward packets. Because DTN can store things at these intermediate nodes, uh, you can route taking time into account. So you can say things like, I've got a schedule. I know what this schedule is going to be, and in 10 minutes, there's going to be really good connectivity over here in this part of the network. Um, that gives us some flexibility, and that sort of is starting to get into something I want to come back to at the end, which is you know, if you had a larger deployment of things that were actually trying, <coughs> uh, actually trying to route on a large scale, how do you deal with questions uh, like, you know, I saw, you I saw you recently, but I don't see you now. You used to be over there. Are you going to come back there? Or are you going to show up somewhere else? Um, because you can plan for things like that. If you tell me that you're going to go somewhere else, I can start sending things in the other direction. You know, things that I'm sending to you, if you say, I'm leaving here now, I'm going to San Francisco, I can start sending things toward the, you know, toward the West Coast so that they'll be there ready and closer to you uh, when you get there. Now again, if you've got you know, the internet as your backing infrastructure, does it make much sense to do that? Maybe not. Uh, but if you're on a battlefield and you're trying to deal with uh, UAVs that are flying over, picking up data out of sensor fields, maybe it does. Um, so there are a couple of, of things that have been, that have been done in this area. There are ports of just regular internet routing protocols, distance vector or link state routing protocols um, to sort of inform these DTN nodes. And, and even then you get into the beginnings of some of these notions of uh, what, to, what to do when things go away. Right? The, in the simple case, you say, well, I'm just gonna make this work the same way internet routing works and that's fine. Um, in the more complex case, you start to ask you know, questions like, well, I've got a link state routing protocol and instead of simply throwing things away when they're not visible, I'm gonna keep track of you know, sort of what the network looked like you know, five and 10 steps ago, and, and I'm gonna to try to do something intelligent uh, about dealing with times when the network gets partitioned. So I'm gonna keep routing you know, in, in the direction that people used to be in, uh, or I'm gonna do something uh, to, you know, to try to make use of some of that. Um, there are a number of, uh, of probabilistic routing schemes that have been developed that are generally apl applied to probabilistic things. Uh, people were, were interested in using DTN as a mechanism to get data back off of zebras. They wanted to track zebras and find out what they, uh, where they were going, what they were eating, what they were doing. Uh, and so there you've got these things that are moving around completely at random, generally because they couldn't afford to collar all of the zebras uh, in, in, the, in the game park. They collared 10% you know, of them. So you've got these things that are moving around, interacting with each other uh, pretty rarely, 
Uh, and then you can apply things like, well, uh, if, if you have seen the, collection, you know, the data collection station more recently than I did, maybe I should give my data to you. Uh, and there's a whole suite of things that, that sort of operate on, on, on those kinds of assumptions. Uh, and then you've got sort of on the other hand, you know, this scheduled routing mechanism that says, I, I know what the schedule is gonna look like and I'm gonna route based on that. On, on sort of the extreme end of that, NASA has got an implementation of a, of a routing protocol that says, you start with all of the information about what all the links are gonna look like in the future, and then you decide you know, which, which of those contacts you're gonna lay the data down onto. So you end up with something that looks almost like source routing in that the, the source is trying to make those kinds of decisions about where things are gonna go. Uh, and then you know, support for database and, and query kind of support is, is above and beyond that. This was the, some of the beginnings of some of that uh, dealing with disconnectivity that we did uh, as part of uh, one of the DARPA exercises. Uh, and I pulled this, in fact, out of the, uh, one of the PM's uh, slide decks. But here, the, the notion was you had two on-the-move things. You had two of these Humvees that had satellite, uh, satellite antennas in them and they were running around, uh, in this case, underneath, uh, underneath a lot of trees, and that caused the BGAN, uh, the BGAN satellite to lose lock. And you might really wanna talk from one of these things to the other if you're doing situational awareness, you know, all the little blue dots moving around on the screen so that you know where your friends are. Um, you might wanna be communicating from one of these things to the other, and the problem is that each one of those links individually and somewhat independently are really, really ratty. So you know, they, they see things, you know, you talk about packet loss. Uh, typically in tactile environments, you see something like 30% packet loss. So you know, the chances of something getting through two of these links is, is really small. Sometimes happens, you know, if they're both out in clear, and have clear line of sight, uh, but not necessarily. So the, the, the trick here was, uh, you know, do some neighbor, some neighbor discovery to find out if you can get directly from one of these mobile units to the other one uh, and if you can, great. Uh, but if you can't, you know, fail back to this battalion node over here on the right. This guy over here is, has got the tent. It's warm, it's dry, he's got air conditioning. Um, it's good to be in the tent, better than the Humvee. Uh, and, and sort of more importantly, he's got a, a, a satellite antenna that's set up with a good clear line of sight to the satellite and no trees. And, and even if there are trees nearby, they're not moving. So once they get it set up and working, you know, he's gonna have good connectivity. So if you can't make it directly from one of these on-the-move units to the other, you know, maybe your best bet is to use, uh, to route through this battalion node and say, well, I couldn't get it there straight, but this guy over here, he's got good connectivity. You know, I'm gonna go set it over there and let him deal with it. Um, and then, you know, with, what, what this shows is, you know, the, in the second slide, you do that from OTM1 uh, and cache something over here at Battalion, and then later you can, you, you can dump it back. And this was all done by just tweaking a little bit uh, uh, distance vector routing, right? All this did was it said, uh, when somebody goes away, you don't, you, you don't age them out all the way. You just cause their cost to start creeping up. And because I, and, and you cause that cost to start creeping up at a higher rate if you're a mobile than if you're a fixed node. And at that point, you start to, you know, when somebody gets disconnected, that fixed node starts to look like a really good way to get to them. Um, I've got a couple of slides in here that talk uh, just protocol stuff, right? Uh, essentially stole a lot of mechanisms uh, from either IPv, you know, all the good places, right? IPv6, uh, RSVP, um, so that these bundles are composed of uh, a series of these, of, of what are called blocks, um, and there are sort of per, both per bundle and per block control flags uh, that you can do all sorts of interesting things with. Um, the, one of the interesting things is this notion of status report flags. So you can say, uh, I want to know things about when this bundle is traveling through, traveling through the network, uh, I want the people who receive it to tell me. Uh, I want to generate a lot of network traffic, right? 
uh, or all the people who take custody of this bundle, I want them to tell me. So you can use that possibly to inform uh, network management and build up this picture of where all of your things are. Uh, you think, well, why would I ever want to know where every packet in my network is? Uh, for terrestrial networks, no, you don't. Um, I've been, this last week, I was over at a standards meeting fighting this battle with the European Space Agency, and by God, they do. Uh, every packet, every file, all the time, where is it? They want to be able to touch it. They want to be able to reorder all of the queues. And oh, by the way, they'd really like to be able to go in to the application data and muck with that while it's sitting in transit waiting to go the next hop. I told them that that was going to be hard. <laughs> um, there are, uh, so, so, you know, that's sort of the basics of, you know, how do you get from here to there? Uh, how can you deal with these long delays and the disconnectivity that comes up? And, in the, in the DARPA context, and I apologize for this being somewhat schizophrenic between, uh, between NASA and DARPA. Um, in the DARPA context, the, you know, there's a lot more interest in sort of uh, further reaching concepts, you might say. So things like content-based networking. I really don't want to care uh, where the server is. You, you mentioned things like service-oriented architectures, uh, to the Navy and they say, oh, that's bad. Why is that bad? Well, because we have no bandwidth. You know, there's not enough bandwidth to do service discovery. So what we want is we want to pre-configure all the service discovery. We want to pre-configure where the, the services live. And you can run down the list and you can maybe try to find one that works if, if the one that you normally use doesn't. But there's not going to be any of this big discovery stuff. Um, so one of the things that we came up with in order to, to support you know, those kinds of notions for, for still doing, you know, something that's content-based is, is using one of these blocks as metadata that describes what the data is, right? You've already got this thing that if you're sending, uh, you know, a map or an image like this, if you're sending this multi-hop through the network and it's doing this store and forward, well, you're going to have to be storing it at the individual nodes as it goes. Uh, and you know, you can throw that, you can throw that away once you forwarded it, or maybe you hold on to it, and you keep the thing and you keep the metadata with it, and if you have a little bit of extra protocol mechanism on top of that, the next guy who comes along and asks for one of those images, you can serve it to him out of the middle of the network. Right? You don't have to go all the way back to the source. Yeah, if something comes in and says, I want the JPEG image of the rover arm, and if that image has already moved hop by hop through the network uh, to somebody who's out there, and the query comes back and touches one of those routers, and you can match that query up against the image, well, then, then you, can, uh, you can serve them, uh, serve them out the, the data that they're looking for. Um, so we actually did some of this and, and have, uh, have looked at doing this in terms of how do you encrypt this data differently? Can you, uh, can you encrypt this metadata differently than the data itself so that you can have people who can search for stuff and find stuff, but don't necessarily have the, the credentials to look at the data that they get. Uh, that turns out to be uh, an important thing to be able to do. Um, and also looking at using this to, uh, to sort of get back a little bit of the granularity of, of the, the hierarchical routing, the region notion that we started out with. Uh, you know, the, one of the things that scares me a little bit is if you've got these giant string-based names you know, what are you going to do when you have 10,000 of those? You know, can you, can you do a lookup against 10,000 uh, 10, names that are not just fixed strings but these queries? You know, how is that going to work? Um, and so one of the ideas there is to take, you know, is to have some nodes do maybe more processing on these, uh, on these names uh, and provide a, a routing hint for, that says almost like landmark routing uh, or, or back to the hierarchical routing notion that says, uh, okay, you know, I looked at this and I think that really this wants to go that way for a while. And if you want to look at it, you know, if you want to go through all the trouble of looking this, this thing up and, and parsing through the, you know, the 10,000 strings and doing whatever you have to do, you can do that. Or you can just sort of take my word for it and let somebody down the line, uh, you know, figure that out. And eventually somebody would have to pick that up again 
and, and, and do that, you know, sort of redo that process. But what that gets you is, uh, it, it, it gets you the capability for doing something like, uh, you know, fisheye routing or, or hazy stated link state, uh, link state routing. Um, just a, a couple of other things. One of the things that we started out with in this was, you know, an absolute need to incorporate security. Uh, one of the things that I didn't mention about the the deep space network that NASA runs is, the, you know, there are three 70 meter antennas, and they're thousands of dollars an hour to run. Uh, NASA won't even actually tell you what they cost. It's it's hard to figure out, but they are expensive. Um, so anybody who wanted to to mount a denial. Eh, and the bitrate going outbound in the commanding direction from Earth to a spacecraft is abysmally low. You know, it's hundreds of bits per second. Mainly because they didn't ever need anything more than that. They weren't looking at closing, at really closing control loops. And so hundreds of bits per second that was really, really reliable to do commanding was a lot better than, you know, a kilobit per second uh, with, with some loss. But the point is, you, you've absolutely got to keep the bad traffic off of those links. Right? Even if somebody can send just complete garbage across, and think of you know, IPsec if you're sending to uh, you know, some destination, it, you can send them packets that don't decrypt. And you've consumed the network resource between where you are and, and where, that, uh, you know, where that destination IPsec device is. And you know, okay, maybe that's not a big deal. Uh, here it was. So one of the things that we, uh, that we sort of built into the security protocol was this notion of mutual suspicion of routers. So that you can have a router that says, yeah, you can send me stuff, but I'm, you know, you've got to authenticate that to me or I'm not going to forward it. Uh, the, the good part about that is you only have to, to, to talk to your immediate neighbors. This, wasn't, uh, this isn't proof against somebody getting overrun. Right? If they get overrun and, and the bad guy steals their keys, well, they can start authenticating traffic, and then that traffic can propagate as far as it wants. Uh, but at least if somebody comes in and jacks into the network and starts sending out bad packets, they're not going to get more than one hop away. Um, and then there's sort of some, uh, you know, sort of commensurate end-to-end uh, -end security, uh, end -end security mechanisms that do either payload integrity or confidentiality. Um, and this extension security block notion uh, is the encryption of uh, individual blocks within uh, within one of these bundles. So as I talked about, you might you might want to encrypt the, the the metadata that talks about how a, uh, what what's in a bundle differently than the the payload itself. Um, okay, so you've got this thing, uh, you've got this mechanism for uh, getting data across these disrupted networks. Uh, you know, how are you gonna, how are you gonna provide that support to applications? Um, and this is sort of the, the, the trilogy of how you can do that. Uh, we, we did this because we had a lot of, uh, a lot of confusion come out of this notion of bridging islands of IP, right? If you wanna take an IP network and drop it down on the surface of Mars, and you, you say, well, I wanna do that, and then I still wanna communicate with it using uh, this disruption tolerant networking protocol, uh, people will tend to think that, that, is, uh, that DTN is then this ferry that you put your IP packets into and they go across the, the, you know, the vastness of deep space and get to the other end. Um, there are a lot of reasons that doesn't work. Um, every application, it turns out, has, has timers in it. You know, if you try to torch up SMTP and, and over a 15-minute delay, it'll get upset. It'll give up. Uh, even things that you don't think of as being particularly... Uh, particularly timer-driven, uh, tend to have those kinds of things in them. Um, application layer gateways, I'll, I'll talk about a little bit more. Um, you know, the notion here is, really, you want to provide support to COTS applications. You know, there's, you know there, there's a vast wealth of applications that people want to run that they already have that you don't have, you don't have the, you know, access to the source to go change. So, you, you know, obviously, the, you know, the, the first way says, all right, you take your application and uh, you go modify it to use D this, this different API for DTN. And people look at you and they say, well, no, that's not going to happen. 
Um, for some things, you can, you can uh, use this gateway approach, and it depends then on, on whether or not you know what the application layer protocol is doing. So for instance, things like internet relay chat, uh, the server-to-server -server part of IRC chat uh, typically has uh, a heartbeat in it that runs you know, on, on some sub-minute kind of scale. Uh, and so if, if, you, if you send a ping message, you don't get a pong message back within some amount of time or you miss so many of those, then uh, the server drops the TCP connection that it was using and game over. Uh, so the, you know, the purpose of the application layer gateway in that, in, in, in that case is you write something that keeps the, the application happy. You write one of these gateway applications that sends Pong messages. Oh yeah, everything's fine. Don't worry about it. Send me your data. And then, uh, and then the gateway application can pick up the, the actual IRC traffic off of, T, off of a TCP connection, dump it down into some of these bundles and use those across the disrupted piece of the network. Um, and so you can do various chunks of that. You can, in fact, tunnel IP across, uh, across DTN. It's just a, a question of what the applications are going to think about that. You know, if you've got a, a, an application that's using TCP and suddenly it sees its round trip time go from you know, 10 or 15 milliseconds out to you know, a minute, a minute and a half, uh, you know, it, it's not going to be happy about that. And this was just another example. This was the... Um, another example of using gateway applications. But here we did something a little bit different. Instead of, uh, with the IRC proxy, we were looking at just, you know, how do you get the, the data out of IRC, you know, across one of these disrupted networks. And in the web proxy, we actually took that a step further and said, well, you know, we can do some value added here. Uh, you know, you think about trying to, you know, what happens if you try to run HTTP across a disrupted network? Well, you can do the get, and then you're going to get the, the base page back, and you've got to, even if you're using 1.1, you've got to go off and get, uh, you know, get, fetch a bunch of different pages. Um, but you could write a proxy that said, sort of along the lines of, of, you know, the FTP proxy that I talked, or FTP mechanism I talked about earlier, you can say, uh, okay, you can ask for this page, and then I'm going to give you a form that says, you know, what page do you want? Do you want me to go off and crawl that, you know, several levels deep? Because, you know, if you want the front page off CNN.com, maybe you want, you know, two or three levels down from that. And, oh, by the way, if your round trip time is, you know, minutes or hours, you're going to get really upset if you have to then click on other, other links there. Um, and, you know, maybe you want to search on, you know, based on keywords or something else. Take all of that and bundle it all together into one of these, you know, one of these packages. Move that package of requests across the network. And then over on the far side, you know, unpack that request in the, on the connected side of the network and do all of the, all the interactive stuff. So you can go off and, do, and, and run HTTP over there. You're connected. You can get all the pages. You can, do, uh, you can crawl the site several levels deep. Uh, you can filter. You can throw stuff out. Um, and then take everything that you got back. You know, once, you, once you've gotten all of those results, you know, build up you know, sort of this web cache uh, uh, web cache nugget, send that back across the network, and, and dump it into the near side proxy, and, and, and then deliver the pages. Um, so what this ended up being was a system where you could say, you know, I want to see CNN.com, and I want to see four levels deep, and uh, either here's what my email address is, or, or here's, the, uh, here's my IM name, tell me when it comes in. So you could, you know, send these things off, and it would go off. And, and you know, when somebody decided that they were going to be nice and plug in the cable, um, you know, then, then you get the, the data back and you get email that says, you know, hey. Um, there are a number of places that are looking at, at deploying, uh, you know, deploying DTN technology. It's flying on the International Space Station. Um, there's a, a payload on board the International Space Station not being used to, to actually control station. Uh, but there's a payload on board that's using DTN as its main mechanism for sending down telemetry. Yeah. Uh, and we've actually got interest there. Uh, that, that's the payload right now is in the, uh, the NASA module, or the American module. And, and we've got interest from uh, the Japanese space agency and also the Europeans to essentially build up a testbed capability 
you know, sort of couple between the Earth and, and the space station and use the, pay, the, the payload land on board the space station as the way of interconnecting things. Um, last year, we, we flew uh, on board a deep impact networking flight experiment. This was to a spacecraft that was about 100 light seconds away from Earth. Uh, so we were actually able to upload uh, a DTN router code onto the spacecraft uh, and, and used it sort of as sort of a, as a simulated node uh, in, in communicating with Mars. So we had a, a path that went from Earth up to the spacecraft and we tweaked the routing so that things would go up to the spacecraft and then uh, back down to Earth and used it to, to send data. An interesting thing there was uh, we saw recovery from errors that we could never have asked for, right? So in the middle of one of the first passes when we were running this deep impact experiment, uh, one, of the, one of the computers in the ground station in the deep space network crashed and rebooted. And you could never ask them to do this for you. Know, for you. you know, oh, we'd like, to, we'd like to experiment with what's gonna happen if something bad you know, goes, goes wrong in the middle of the pass. No way. Uh, but this computer crashed and rebooted and the custody transfer mechanism, these mechanisms for maintaining reliability in hop by hop fashion, kicked in and actually recovered from the error. And it took them a while to figure that out uh, because you know, they, weren't, they weren't expecting things to work that way. Um, one of the other interesting things about station, you know, I said that uh, you know, mission managers are, are massively conservative. The, some of the custody transfer mechanisms uh, that, we've, uh, that are running between station and the Earth uh, in order to provide the reliability are some of the first things that are actually allowed to flow, you know, uh, protocol mechanisms that flow back up to space station without being checked heavily by humans. Right? Most things, any, almost anything that goes up that is a command to a spacecraft has got a history of who looked at that command and who pushed the button that actually sent it out. Um, and so some of the, when some of the, uh, for the traffic that we're flowing to station, they've actually uh, were, got comfortable enough with that after doing the human trick several, uh, several times uh, to say, okay, you know, we understand that this traffic is just acknowledgements, it's gonna be okay, uh, and, the, and they allow it to go up with minimal checking from people. Um, and then there's some, some other interesting parts. Uh, it, you know, connectivity to disadvantaged users. There's, uh, an experiment that, that happens each year uh, in the, the northern part of Sweden talking to the, the Sami community. And, and here, you know, this is a community of, of people that don't have the infrastructure. They live too far north for, to get good geosynchronous satellite coverage. There's not enough of them and they don't happen to be rich enough uh, that anybody particularly cares about giving them self, uh, you know, cell tower coverage. Um, and what they, and, and it's a community of essentially nomadic reindeer herders. So these people go off and, and uh, take care of, uh, of herds of reindeer throughout the year. And uh, what they do have though are snowmobiles. They have snowmobiles, there's some mining activity, they have reindeer, and they have bars. Um, so you say, well, okay. Um, you put a Wi-Fi connection on the back of the snowmobile together with a laptop and you know, something that looks like DTN, and when two snowmobiles get together, you can exchange, you, know, you can propagate the newspaper or something, you know, basic news, uh, and get it further out than, than you can get in a single hop. Um, scaling in number, uh, as I said, not, not particularly strong here. There, there are deployments uh, of, of DTN that look like hundreds of nodes, uh, not thousands of nodes. The, the interesting thing to think about here, is, though, is the, the problem with dealing with IP mobility is having to try to maintain this sort of very, very strict and regimented view of the network, right? You're trying to track exactly what the network looks like at all times so that you can forward packets. And what DTN lets you do is it lets you relax that a little bit. It lets you say, look, you know, you don't have to have the answer right now for, for some classes of traffic, uh, as long as you don't have to have, as long as it's not real-time uh, voice traffic or something that, re that really requires that real-time end-to-end interaction. You're willing to take, you know, a little bit of slop in terms of knowing what the network looks like, and you can hold on to that data and get it through later. 
and so the you know the the questions then are you know what do you do in, when people disappear? How do you deal with that? How do you figure out uh, if you think they're going to reappear somewhere else later? Are they just gone? Um, and how to how to manage routing? Um, the, 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 there's also this culture question. You know, what do you wait? What do you mean? My cell phone is going to be routing your data. Um, do I trust? Or, or the converse is, do I trust you to route my data? Right? I'd better be using a lot of those security mechanisms if I'm going to start routing my data through your cell phone, uh, because you can guarantee that people are going to want to see that. Um, And that's it. I left time uh, in this for questions. This, uh, you know, thanks to there, there are whole teams behind each one of these. Uh, a lot of these slides were, uh, as I said, were taken from a, an internal presentation that we put together. Uh, DARPA has been very supportive of this. Uh, the DTNRG within the IRTF, um, and, and also NASA. So um, this idea of a store and forward network actually seems pretty cool. Um, but uh, so one thing that um, maybe I missed this or didn't understand or maybe didn't cover it. Um, so what happens if a node actually has ownership of a packet and then that node, you know, Blows gets up. hit by a meteor or something, right? Uh, I mean, that seems to imply that not only is that bundle totally lost, but then there isn't even any indication to either the source or the destination that the bundle was lost. Right. Uh, so in the, in the realm of things that we've thought about but haven't actually implemented, uh, there, right now the, the notion of custody transfer that we have has a single custodian. So somebody has got custody of that bundle, they're responsible for retransmitting. If they get hit by a meteor, you know, you're toast. Um, it seems like it would be pretty easy to extend that to a rolling, uh, essentially a rolling two custodian so that you have you know, two people at any time who are responsible for doing retransmissions, and when, when something gets to the third guy, you don't, tell the, you don't tell the previous guy like we do now, you tell the guy who's two behind you. And you could roll things off like that. Um, the other mechanism for, uh, for dealing with, you know, the case where, you know, something goes, something goes wrong and, and nobody ever hears of it uh, is, is in some of the diagnostics. You can, you can inform people, you know, I received this at such such a time, you can know what happened to it that way, you can't get it back, right? You really need this, this notion of either rolling custodians or, uh, or, or you could do multipath routing. Right, and, and I, I would guess that that would get into issues of, um, you know, if you're sort of, particularly if you're sort of hanging on to the bundle, you know, on multiple nodes, then you have to worry about, you know, how many you, you allow that to happen on so you don't yep. get the network all congested with a bunch of stuff that hasn't been delivered yet. Right. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah I, I was curious, how much work have you, uh, have you, have you, have you done with uh, more terrestrial projects such as uh, LHC and, and such that need to really move bulk data over potentially congested networks that aren't necessarily, doesn't need to be done in real time, but we really need to say get the data from the LHC to Berkeley. Yeah. Um, and, and better utilize uh, existing links at, at, at periods of low congestion. So, I haven't done a lot of that. The, there have been some people that were looking at mainly not, not sort of the mainstream kinds of applications, but more support for uh, dis these disadvantaged users, but looking at uh, like replicated file stores over DTN. Yeah. Um, and, and the place where, where I think that actually has you know, some applicability, where DTN has some applicability there, is mainly as you know, you could use file transfers in a scavenger class, a truly scavenger class that, uh, whose job was to get out of the way of all of the interactive traffic that's going on in the network um, and, uh, and only, you know, sort of only use the network when it's otherwise lightly loaded. The, the hop by hop, you know, function can get you out of, uh, you know, might be able to get you some increased performance if you had a, uh, you know, a dedicated network for doing that. Yeah, I think it's rather interesting because it's a really good uh, generic model for like bulk data transfer. Mm. I mean, you could end up getting, you know, say, data to Chicago, and the Chicago node decides I'm never going to get enough bandwidth to Berkeley, so it's easier to say right. put these on hard drives and FedEx them. Right. 
and it would be kind of interesting to, to extend that. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so, you know, dealing with, and, and there's another interesting question there, and I didn't get into, you know, a lot of the, you know, what's in the headers, but what do you do if your packet transfer mechanism is a USB key, right? You know, how do you, you know, how do you deal with spinning something off to a USB key, plugging it in somewhere else, having it come up, uh, and, and deal with things like, well, how old is this? You know, when was this supposed to die? Um, and so, like, one of the things that, we've, that we have is, is wall clock time to live that's supposed to say, you know, if, if you put something on this key and it was supposed to be good for, you know, 20 minutes, uh, but it's three days later, uh, you should probably throw it away. Is there, is there deadline scheduling built into the protocol? Pardon? Uh, is there deadline scheduling built into the protocol? Right, yeah. yeah. Sort of related to that or following up on that, something that I never quite understood about this was there's this premise that we're going to store data in intermediate nodes, and th this seems to suggest that this will only work in cases where storage is, quote, cheap, unquote, compared to bandwidth. How big a constraint is that? So in, in many cases, that's a good assumption. In some, it's not. Uh, the assumption of storage, it, it's, not a, it's, a, it's not a requirement that you, store, you actually store data in the network using DTN. Uh, you're allowed to simply forward things on, even if uh, a bundle is marked for this custody transfer mechanism. You know, we have a notion of who the current custodian is, and that's the person you tell when you take custody. But that might be several hops down the road. So I might, you know, I might be the current custodian for something, transmit to you. If you don't have any storage, you know, all you've got is enough storage to manage the thing in and then back out. Uh, you know, you're certainly free to do that without storing it. If you take custody of something, there is this implication that you know, you're, you're taking responsibility. Uh, you really ought to be doing all that you can to ensure that you know, the thing isn't going to get lost, and that probably means spinning it off to persistent storage somewhere. Um, but you're certainly not required to take custody at each hop. If I don't take custody, then I act just like a normal IP router, right? Yeah. And, OK. In other words, for anything new to happen, there has to be storage in the network. Pardon? Otherwise, it just looks like IP. Pardon? In other words, for anything new to happen, anything like really characteristically DTN-ish, there has to be storage. Otherwise, everybody just acts like an IP router. Um, right, because otherwise, I mean, if you, otherwise, you would have to be able to forward something. If, if you don't have any storage, you would have to be able to forward everything as soon as you got it, right? And that's sort of the, that, that, that is the piece that we're, or one of, the, one of the pieces that we're trying to break, you know, by, by allowing you just to hold on to data. Gotcha. Thanks. Hi. Uh, this also has to do with the, uh, the store and forward model. Um, once you um, have content um, with with your um, TTL set long enough that um, you can uh, assume it's stored in some intermediate node, uh, if you wanted to, say, retransmit re the same content, would you be able to address that in some way from the transmit side? So. Uh, you're, you're certainly allowed to, if you have a copy, if you have a copy of the data, you're allowed to retransmit it. Right, but if you, you, if you as the sender um, on one end of, you know, the long list of notes uh, can uh, guarantee that the content's still stored on, um, on disk for, or somewhere on, uh, in an intermediate node, if you wanted to retransmit um, and while addressing the uh, previous content that you, uh, you sent already, instead of actually transmitting it again from the beginning? Um, would that, is there some way to address um, that content? Or is that com completely transparent to the uh, sender? I, I apologize, but I still didn't quite understand that. OK. Um, just basically as a form of compression, if you, if you, if you sent a data packet with a fi uh, fixed content metadata and right. you wanted to send uh, another identical packet, and if you can guarantee, um, based on the time to live of the previous transmitted packet, that it's that some node might still be holding onto it, uh, c would you be able to uh, um, just tell um, that node? Oh, I to, see. Could you could you simply essentially send like a third party directive that said resend this? Right. Uh, we don't have a protocol mechanism for doing that. Um, you know, I, I could see, you know, I could see a lot of, you know, opportunity for network management to, 
to try to do something like that. Uh, the, the issue there would be knowing exactly who had that data. Uh, you know, there's enough, there's enough in the diagnostics that you can, you can have a good idea of who that is. Um, but it, it would, that would probably, in practice, that would probably be tough. Okay, thanks. Along the same lines, um, what happens when a packet that gets retransmitted uh, shows up at uh, one of these intermediate nodes that happens to have it uh, queued up waiting for the, you know, the moon to get out of the way or whatever? Right. Uh, at that point, it's, it's sort of up to the node, it's up to the implementation to decide what it wants to do with, with duplicate, duplicate bundles. Uh, the, the implementation that the IRTF group has will actually go through and scour out duplicate bundles if they happen to, you know, if they happen to show up in the same node. If, you know, if, if one node ends up with, with two copies of, of a given bundle, it'll scour them out. Uh, but it's not particularly smart about uh, if it sees the same thing come through four times, uh, it won't do anything about that. Um. Okay, so uh, I believe you mentioned that there is some uh, a multiple routing option built in where you can you know, send a packet in multiple directions at the same time, right? Mm -hmm. um, and obviously there's cases like your snowmobile example where you'd want to do that because you don't know which snowmobile is going to get to the, the base camp first. Right. Do you have a way to then flush those out of the queues everywhere? Do you have a, a, right. a broadcast ACK, if you will, that, to that go off and it will use your spare bandwidth every time two snowmobiles get together to say, hey, all of these packets, you can get rid of them. The, the kill bundle, right? right. You, want, you want the hunter-killer bundle to go off and, and, and stop other things from happening. Uh, no. Um, <laughs> the, the thought is, well, so, so the short answer is no. Um, the thought is that that's really hard to do, right? You don't, you don't necessarily know what routing decisions were made before on the original bundle. You'd have to somehow keep track of that and, and be able to find those. Uh, and then you have to catch up to it, which might or might not be something that's, that's doable, right? You know, if, you, if you've got this highly disrupted network, you, I, I might not be able to catch the thing that's three hops ahead of me, you know, regardless. Um, you know, that said, you know, some of, the, some of the other implementations, there's one by BBN that I think does do something like that. Uh, they go off and, and, and have, I think, some version of a purge, but I'm not sure. Okay. So, um, one of, as you mentioned, this, this really sort of is a concept of, of, you know, making the network smarter than, than the endpoints in, in a lot of ways. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, as I'm thinking about this, the implications of that are, are still dawning on me. Um, it occurs to me that one of the problems is that anytime that if the network has to be aware of application level protocols, then anytime a new protocol comes along, you have to update the entire network in order to be able to handle it. Um, what mechanism, what, what, what approach would you take to handle that? How, how extensible is it? How easy is it to add support, you know, for, for new protocol, new application level protocols in, in a DTN network? Right. So. You know, in, in this model, the, the DTN layer, this bundle layer, is serving as a network layer for applications. So you say, I want to deploy this disruption tolerant, you know, this, this a, almost like an overlay network on top of other stuff, on top of these various transport layers. And that's, in fact, the way that we, we tend to use DTN, you know, for, for like the military applications. For the space applications, they run it directly over the link. Um, but in that sense, there's nothing that needs to be done for, for new applications that come along. You know, they, as long as they write to the, the, the DTN API, uh, you know, it is the network layer, it is, it is, you know, one thing that doesn't have to change. So you can come along with lots of different applications and, and not have to swap out anything, you know, in the middle of the network to support them. Well, but, I mean, don't, don't you at least need a way to, like, encode them in the DTN URLs? URIs, URLs, whatever. You, you have to have, right, and so the, and the question there is exactly what, what does routing mean, right, you know, and, and that's something that is not well defined yet, but presumably, you know, there, right, if you had the, if the URIs were application specific and contained application specific stuff, yes, you'd be dead, right, because you'd have to push out, you know, some sort of, you'd either be dead or you'd have to push some quasi-active networking thing out into the network to make that happen. But I suspect that that's, that's really not going to be 
the case for, for a lot of things. Right? Host and port actually tend to get you a really long way. I, uh, there, there are lots of people that want to look at things like, you know, I want to send a message to, to this location, and I want to send it to everybody within like 100 meters of that place. And I want everybody who walks, you know, anybody who happens to, to walk into that circle to suddenly get it. Um, you know, an, an interesting thing to be able to do, but it requires that routing support. And so one of the things that, that needs to happen is to figure out, well, you know, what pieces of, you know, what pieces of that functionality are, what, you know, are far enough along and, and useful enough you know, to actually develop and deploy. All right, um, and, and if, so, you're, so you're saying that, that DTN is really sort of, you're expecting it to be the application networking layer. So in that case, does, does that imply that you, you're sort of envisioning a, a far future where um, basically even for terrestrial communication, DTN sits between the application and TCP so that applications don't need to know about both interfaces? I, and the, the question is with a, depending on how well provisioned and how pervasive the terrestrial network is, do you ever need that, right? If, again, you know, if you've got a BlackBerry and your BlackBerry works everywhere, okay, fine. Uh, you know, so for a, a lot of those cases where you have an infrastructure that's one, you know, one wireless hop away, uh, I think it doesn't necessarily make all that much sense. Uh, you could think of, you know, what, what would happen if you tried to go in and, and slip, you know, you know, slip this bundle layer on top of, of sort of all of IP. Um, you'd quickly run into massive problems in scaling. Well, I, I, I was thinking less in terms of, of you know, actually having it transported over D DTN, but more in terms of just what is the API that the application needs to do it, you know, to use to do its networking, right? If, if every application needs to be written to be able to use both different APIs, and that makes the application code more complicated. Right. But if it's just, okay, it uses the DTN API, and then immediately under the hood, that just gets translated to TCP and, right. and you know, done the old-fashioned way. That yeah. seems and, like a win for applications. And, and, and modulo the, the problems with scalability and routing, that, you know, that's certainly possible. There's nothing in, in DTN that says you have to have delay, right? right? And, and you, know, you, can, you could drop directly down, and in fact, you know, almost most, probably all of the, the implementations will run on top of TCP. So, you know, and, and at that point, you, know, you have an, uh, another interesting question of, if you're running on top of TCP, you know, who are your neighbors, right? How, you know, how far can you get, you know, stitching up a single TCP connection? If it's on Earth, you can get pretty far. Um, and at that point, everybody looks like a one-hop neighbor. Well, is that really what you want to do? Um, right. Okay, thank you. Have you learned any uh, particularly useful things from existing store and forward networks or store and forward systems such as the post office or the S or SMTP? So we, the, there, there was a lot made when we, when, especially back when we first started, you know, thinking of a Pony Express kind of model for, you know, for data carriage. Uh, and so we, we sort of tried to base a lot of the, the early mechanisms uh, on that. So, you know, things like levels of priority, you've got a couple of rather coarse levels of priority that you can assign to things. Um, I, I think if, if things like Netflix or some of the other, you know, sort of, you know, bulk transfer kinds of, uh, of things have been around, there was one, um, I'm blanking on the name, there was, uh, like, PostNet, I want to say. There was some, somebody had tried to, uh, you thought of an implementation that it was essentially, you know, networking over, over snail mail. Where, where I think sent. Google offered to print out your mail and mail it to you. Yeah. <laughs> They'll open all your mail and tell you what's in it. Um, so yeah, you, you know, we, we looked into some of those um, and, and, you know, tried to, tried to take what we could. A lot of it was, uh, was actually more not, not taken from, you know, existing store and forward systems so much uh, as trying to figure out you know how to how to structure you know some of the information so that we could uh, you know try to compress out some of these long URI names things like that. Just a yeah. Short follow up. So, 
there are already times where, say, I have my cell phone, you know, you drive through a part that doesn't have reception, you get back into an area with reception, suddenly, you know, a voicemail shows up. Or right. So this sort of thing already works. How useful is an example like that? Right. It, and, and, and that's one of the things that we're struggling with. It, if you, uh, again, if you have this sort of pervasive infrastructure to support your cell phone, uh, you know, yeah, that, you know, that sort of militates against, you know, trying to do, go to these sort of, her, you know, heroic measures to try to get you connectivity when you happen to be in the middle of a tunnel and, and just can't get there right now. You know, why are you going to try to route through somebody else's phone to, to you know, to get out of the tunnel? Um, for, for some of these other applications, you know, you don't have the infrastructure. Uh, you know, it, it's, I agree that it's, it's a hard sell to say, you know, you should, you should, you should think about, you know, what's going to happen if you rip out all of, you know, the Earth's infrastructure and replace it with DTN. You know, an interesting, an interesting thing to think about, but, you know, again, if you've got this pervasive infrastructure, I could turn on wireless and presumably if the wireless were working, um, uh, you know, get out you know, easily. I was curious to hear what thoughts, if any, you guys have given towards uh, DTN's version of ISAMP. You know, um, discovering not not only like firing forget, you know, get this to them if you see them, but do we physically have a route to this particular node? Have we ever? When was the last time they were seen? Who still has custody of this particular payload? That kind of thing. So the in, those, those are sort of I think those are different questions, right? One one the Right, so there there are notions of uh, of status reports of bundles that you can use to try to generate some information about where things have gone and what's happened with them, like who took custody of this thing when, um, and you can cause you can cause those reports to go to a third party. So you can be the sender and you can say, I'm going to launch this bundle, and everybody who takes custody of it, I want you to tell this guy over here because I don't want to know about it. Um, in terms of things like uh, neighbor discovery, you know, who's your neighbor, you know, that starts to get really interesting because, you know, you, you, you have this problem of, uh, especially when you, when you think of, of wireless and tactical environments, if I'm running over TCP, well, everybody can be my neighbor, right? I can, I can hit people that are, you know, 15 hops away. Uh, but is it really a good idea to do that? You know, it goes back to the, you know, if I'm trying to move this file from Chicago to, to Berkeley, you know, I might be able to do that, but if the individual links in that chain are ratty, you know, there's a trade that I can make that says, you know, I could find people that are 15 IP hops away from me, but the reliability goes down with distance. And at some point, it's better for me to say, you know, it's better to not go further, to take the, take the guy that's four hops away from me and let him relay it for me. Um, and, and yeah, it, that's about as far as we've gone in terms of, uh, you know, sort of the, the, the network management ICMP kinds of, of traffic, really. You know, th there are notions of how to do uh, neighbor discovery. None of it has, has been, only, only the very basics of it have, have even made it to internet drafts. I just wanted to thank you for the, the work you're doing here. I am interested in informatics and, you know, taking the internet to areas that don't have it or looking at using not stimulus money on fiber loading up very rural neighborhoods, but putting wireless on, say, the mail truck that goes mm -hmm. through every day or on oh. community buses that drive through and do that. And so we can look at the issue of the challenges we have today as internet citizens where we are so connected, where we we have this, this terrestrial network implies that we can always connect to Google, that we can always, yeah. you know, that Twitter is always up. <laughs> and so, you know, as long as now you've got this layer that we don't have to think about, we can use the same technology to get to Mars that we can use out in very rural, mm -hmm. uh, you know, middle America type things, third world things. Right. And then just worry about how we do caching web things and, and, and think about, if we can do Google Voice, we could do delayed searches. Mm -hmm. and, and worry about that kind of buffering and not have to worry about the stuff yeah. in the middle. So that's very cool. Thank yeah. you. This, the, this was, a lot of this was motivated when, when we went back to DARPA the second time. Uh, it was actually um, Vint Cerf and, uh, and another, uh, one of my colleagues from MITRE went back and, and pitched this. And they went back to the, the PI there and said, oh, we have this great idea for doing this. And 
we got lucky in a sense in that he was running several different programs that were dealing with things like unattended ground sensors uh, and, and things that were, that were not, you know, not well connected. Uh, and he looked out and said, well, so here's the deal. You know, lots of, you know, this isn't hard to do. Right? You, know, lots of, you, can, you can easily sit down and, and in you know, an hour think of, you know, how would I build a system that would send this, this data across multiple hops? And the problem is lots and lots of people did this. And, and, and what the, 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 the program manager at, at DARPA saw was, um, this was Preston Marshall at the time, was that he had you know, eight programs and, and like six of them were doing something like this. But it wasn't their primary job. Right. Their primary job was building unattended ground sensors. And yeah, they had to get the data out, but you know, okay, you know, we'll, we'll find some way to, to make that happen. Um, and, and so part of the goal w was at the time you know, was to, to try to build this infrastructure layer and, and you know, you know, push this common service down you know, into the network so that it could be, be shared by a number of different applications and leveraged. Thank you. All right. Thank you.